Thank you. Great to be back. I, I think my, my issue with the CIS goes back even further to when the, the CIS probably were the first organization to train me at our Liberty and Society uh, probably almost a decade ago with the, the great Andrew Norton led program. I think with some of the explanations to, to COVID-19, we've seen quite a lot of motivated reasoning from people who effectively want to pigeonhole their, their um, favourite horse into the race and, and claim that that's the explaining factor here. So we've seen explanations about female leaders um, like Justin Trudeau or Angela Merkel, but of course that doesn't particularly well explain uh, countries like Japan or South Korea or Australia that are led by male leaders that have also done particularly well. There's been explanations about populists that I don't think are particularly persuading since perfectly liberal enlightened leaders have also performed badly in the face of COVID as well as um, allegedly populist leaders. I think there's some explanation with the amount of health spending a country has it doesn't actually tend to correlate that well to performance. Uh, Singapore and Taiwan and South Korea spend relatively little um, a proportion of their GDP on health and yet it performed exceptionally well while some of the countries that spend a lot in Europe and Australia um so not Australia in there but it's only in Europe and the US and and whatnot have not done that well so I think a lot of the explainers for countries that haven't haven't done well in COVID-19 when you compare it against the, the number of deaths that country's had as a, as a very top level measure don't really provide much persuasive power So my argument is effectively that it's a question of competence and uh, as, as bland and as boring as that is, it's really about the capacity of the state to marshal resources towards a particular end. And when it comes to handling an infectious disease, um, it turned out that a number of key steps were necessary. Um, first of all, a, a willingness and an ability to close borders um, relatively early on in the pandemic to prevent uh, a high number of cases coming into your country. And then subsequently, when there were cases in your country, being able to undertake testing of those cases, which is a, a large logistical effort, um, and then tracing any positive cases and contacting them swiftly in order to ensure proper isolation. Now, that is not rocket science. It, it, it's actually a pretty standard public health formula, the, the idea of contact tracing of uh, an infectious disease. But what we saw is wildly different capacities to do it across the globe and, and even within Australia as well. I, I do to a, a large extent, actually. I, I think we underestimate the extent to which we're good at governing. I mean, there's some explanations that, that go back to the fact that Australia was uh, effectively founded as a colonial um, nation governed by, by bureaucrats. And we've managed to sustainably, more or less, not perfectly, but remain with relatively competent government so that when the, the COVID pandemic did come, we had a, a good capacity to um, analyse the situation carefully, um, understand what the risks were, close the borders, and then within most states, at least most of the time, do quite effective contact tracing. And I think New South Wales is probably world leading in particular on, on this front, where it's just the ability of New South Wales contact tracers to very quickly get on top of cases, to identify them, to contact the people, showed a, a level of competence that I, I think is, is quite high and actually 
um, we, we talk more about this, but I think builds on a lot of investment in state capacity in New South Wales. Um, it, it's probably a, a bit of a, a weird lecture coming from someone currently in Melbourne in, in Victoria lecturing you about uh, Service New South Wales, but the, the functionality just provided by um, that app and, and by that the call center in order as an interface with government is beyond anything that exists in Victoria. Um, and it's the simple things that you're not gonna notice. It's the digital driver's license. Um, it's the being able to call someone up and speak to someone about any issue you have and then picking up the phone and that kind of capacity of the state at a base level that, that New South Wales has very much um, shown itself to, to be leaning in in Australia and in a global context. Um, and, and what I tried to do in the article that I'm referring to is con compare and contrast that to uh, Victoria, which had uh, a lot less investment in state capacity and ultimately didn't have the, the ability to marshal the necessary resources, both to operate hotel quarantine um, and then subsequently to do the contact tracing. And that as a multi-step failure that, that basically undermined the substantial benefit that Australia had in terms of shutting the borders um, and undermined people's health and undermined people's liberty for such a long period of time in Victoria's lockdown. Look, I think we should absolutely take concerns about privacy when the government's infringing on our privacy quite seriously. I mean, everywhere else in the world, you currently do have to, if you're going to restaurants and bars, have to check in. Um, in New South Wales, it's, it's done through the service New South, New South Wales app, which is relatively, um, from my experience, is quite user-friendly and, and much more effective and much better enforced. Um, in terms of COVID, I think we're willing to some extent to make some sacrifices when it comes to our privacy. And I, I find that as someone who is a considers myself a civil libertarian, but in order to protect the kind of global health. Now, should something like that continue on after COVID when the threat goes away? Absolutely not. Um, should the data that's been collected be used for anything else other than contact tracing? Absolutely not. Should the data be deleted as soon as possible, be it 28 days or, or whatever the specific number is? Absolutely. So I think it's about building in the privacy protections and not using COVID as a model for a new kind of surveillance state. Um, in terms of the kind of broader information that Service New South Wales gathers about you, I mean, quite frankly, the government's going to have that information about you anyway. Um, and it, whether or not they're providing a usable interface for you to interact with them or not, um, I think is largely in your benefit, um, even if it does require a lot of data gathering. And I don't know there have been issues with Service New South Wales and data leaks and, and hacking attempts. I think that is something that, that we should take seriously as an issue um, it, when it comes to this. And, and the government should only collect the minimum possible information information that they need about us and they should protect it very well um, and I think it is unacceptable when, when those systems fail. Well, there are many places that are more and less dense than Australia that had varied outcomes. Um, I think when you look at the overall statistics, density is not a great correlation for um, COVID success or failure because it, it will have some effect in the short term, of course, if, if you're interacting with more people about how quickly it spreads. But what Australia managed to do was actually stop it spreading in the first place. It wouldn't have mattered how dense Australia was. And I'll also add on top of that, it, Australia, overall isn't very dense, but our cities are still relatively dense and there are still a lot of interactions going on in our cities. So Australia, Australia is urban density. If you just look at the cities where um, two thirds, three quarters of people actually live in Australia, we are quite dense. In fact, more dense than a lot of European countries that have a lot less um, pop of proportion of their population in, in large cities. So I don't, I don't know if the, the density um, argument buys out. Um, Hygiene didn't end up having as much of an impact on COVID as we originally thought it did. Um, there's not strong evidence of substantial transmission um, by what the scientists call fomites, foamite, so that um, on surfaces or touching someone's hands, it's not clear that you can get a high enough viral load from a surface. So although hygiene is good and hygiene is probably quite effective, particularly against other diseases, it's not a key explainer when it comes to COVID. Um, I mean, in a sense, Australia got lucky that when cases were growing quite rapidly in Europe, 
um, they hadn't quite grown to that extent in Australia yet. So that showed they had a little bit of extra time. But at the same time, um, the decision on the 1st of February by, by Scott Morrison, by the federal government to be relatively precautionary in a sense, and I'm not usually a, a fan of the precautionary principle, but when it came to shutting um, travel to people who'd been in China the last two weeks, um, that prevented an initial surge in cases that would have come in February of, of international students coming to Australia. Um, so just that decision alone uh, that was heavily criticised was, was labelled at the time as xenophobic and Trumpian. I mean, if, if Europeans had done the same kind of precaution, uh, they wouldn't have the, the hundreds of thousands of deaths they have today. They wouldn't necessarily have these huge waves of the virus. Now, I understand that Australia's success hasn't been costless um, in terms of the impact on civil liberties, um, impact on travel. Uh, it, it has absolutely cost a lot, but I think it's cost a lot less, particularly today where Australians are living particularly freely, whilst uh, most, um, oh, sorry, a lot of European countries are diving in and out of lockdowns. Um, I, I think we're in a pretty blessed position and we should appreciate that success even if we're not uh, even if it's not perfect we should appreciate the level of success we've achieved Look, not precisely, and, and I have a lot of sympathy for the, the idea of shrinking the size of the state. If, if you're going to talk about competence and success, um, and you're going to talk about prosperity, a, a smaller state is often a, a better state. Uh, we know that countries with less government, with less regulations, with lower taxes, lead to more prosperous societies. Uh, we know that a smaller state can actually be a more focused state. I think part of the issue and part of the incompetence of the state is that it tries to do too much. Um, it, it tries to in involve itself in too many areas rather than being focused and, and more effective as a result. But the kind of argument and where I do depart from the kind of Barrow Goldwater worldview is that I think we should also care about the competency of the state. I think we've seen that in the COVID era where um, quite frankly, there are some things that are collective action problems. There are um, negative externalities. There are areas where the state um, does need to get involved, areas where the state is involved that we might disagree with its involvement, but still at the same time, we're all kind of more or less shareholders in the state. Uh, we all pay a, a huge um, quantity of our income to the state uh, through taxes. Uh, we all vote for the state. I think we have a very personal interest um, in the success of the state. We should want the state to do well. We should want it to be competent. We should want it to, we should want to do less, but we should want to do what it does well. And I think the issue with the, the, the Barry Goldwater worldview is that it misses out on that second part. It, it, realistically, that the state has not shrunk. Um, we haven't achieved the anarchist libertarian utopia where the state you know, withers away in, a, in the, to borrow a Marxist term, um, and the state no longer exists. The state is, is quite frankly here to stay. Um, and if it's here to stay, I think we have a responsibility uh, as citizens to try to hold it to account for success. And I think that's actually a key role of, of think tanks on our side of politics. There's a lot of state failure um, evident in responses to COVID. There was extreme state failure in Victoria when it came to hotel quarantine, when it came to um, contact tracing. There was a lot of state failure in, in the UK that I, I focus on quite closely when it came to public health England, restricting um, testing quite substantially, not using the private sector, not using charities, not using universities at the key moment that the UK needed to increase testing. And they just gave up on testing and they gave up on contact tracing. And there was actually a similar story in the US where the CDC um, and the FDA didn't approve third party tests. So there was a huge outbreak of COVID going on in the US. 
They couldn't do any tests. They didn't see it coming to the extent to which they should have, and therefore they were slow to act um, in response to the virus. So, so we should absolutely analyze state failure and understand state failure and know that the state will inevitably fail in a lot of ways for the, the kind of good libertarian reasons we understand. But we should also wanna make sure that when it is involved with things that it does them as well as possible. I mean, we, we should, it is very difficult to. The, the, the trouble with the state is the state is monopoly whilst a normal business has competition. Um, and when the state fails to provide public health, um, it's very difficult for anyone else to step in. If the state fails to provide defense services, it's difficult for anyone else to step in. So, so the, the competition aspect lower, inevitably lowers the quality of the state. And that's a good argument for why we should want the state to do less. So if you just you know, pick a field like education, um, I think we should still be advocates of things like um, school vouchers and school choice because that increases competition even if it is state delivered um giving par parents and, and students and kids more choice um increases the quality of, of their education so we should still try to find ways we can introduce market mechanisms and market accountability um into the operations of the state i, I mean I, I think it's often overly simply to say oh why can't the state just operate like a business well i know businesses don't have people running around with um guns <laughs> Uh, very often with the, you know, monopoly on the use of power and, and violence. I think we, we do have to treat the state differently in some ways to a business, even if we might want it to be more business-like in its competence. I mean, going back to the, the service New South Wales example, there's a big uh, focus in South Wales, there's a minister for customer service, you know, very, um, and in fact, I think it's almost the role of the state to, to see itself more as serving its citizens rather than being distant. And I think that's something New South Wales has done very well um, in terms of trying to get up customer satisfaction as a goal of state services. Uh, and I think the state in some ways needs to adopt that, not completely. Um, there's also, we need to be careful not to think it's of itself as, a, as an innovator. Um, the state doesn't need to be at the forefront of AI and machine learning and all these kind of complex sciences. It just actually needs to do the basic things really well. Um, it doesn't, and if it can do that, then it, it's going to serve its citizens. It doesn't need to be innovative and it doesn't need to act like a business competitively. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't need to turn a profit, certainly. So it's not exactly like a business, but there are some things from business and from the private sector that should almost only be brought into the state. I mean, I think that's certainly what the government does. Every election, politicians are going around uh, promising, you know, little grants here, bits and pieces there, just anything that looks popular. Um, I think that's where then we have to hold it to account because as it tries to do more things, it's going to become less competent, particularly when it's, it steps outside its fundamental areas of competence. Um, the state also inevitably gets hijacked um, by special interests, by the whoever's most influential. And the state is a huge pot of money that people try to scrape bits and piece out of pieces out of all the time. People, you know, even businesses do this when they're seeking grants from the government for all sorts of different things. Now, is there any evidence whatsoever that the government providing, let's say, innovation grants um, increases the amount of innovation and entrepreneurship? Absolutely not, because the people who apply and receive those grants are not the, the innovators and the entrepreneurs, they're the people who are best and applying for grants. So I think there's still an important accountability mechanism here um, where we have to try to push for a smaller state while saying when the state does exist, it needs to be competent in what it does. Um, I don't buy the idea that the libertarian strategy should be, well, let's let the state fail, let's make sure it's incompetent, and then that'll never be lead to a smaller state. I don't think we, we see that as a reality. Um, I think what we, what we more so want um, in order to make you know, a functioning market economy work as a competent state. You know, we, we talk about this, the, the, the idea of like state capacity that I'm applying in the, the COVID context is really a classic concept from development, particularly market-based development economics. If you look at why nations fail, it's, it's uh, the, the kind of classic book on that topic. It's because they lack the institutions, they lack the basic state capacity to um, have 
the rule of law that have courts that can enforce contracts. And if you don't have contracts, you don't have basic infrastructure like roads, um, and you, you don't have the, the confidence to do market transactions without um, people potentially defrauding you and you having nowhere to go, then the market can't function. So I think even you know minimalist state advocates understand that you need some level of state capacity for the market to work and for the market uh, to succeed. Um, and it's about building those institutions, building up that state capacity, not going too far. Again, I think it is it is important to highlight again and again that when the state tries to do, much, do too much, it fails by trying to do too much. Um, and that's not a good outcome. Um, and it, there's, there's a the balance to be reached in terms of doing a relatively small number of things, but doing them relatively well. I think there is a tendency when people feel threatened to look for a savior, for a, a protector. And if you look at just what happened over the weekend in Western Australia, the perception is for right or for wrong that Mark McGowan you know, saved my granny's life, that Mark McGowan saved WA. It's probably true to some extent, um, I, probably not true to the extent to which he's claiming. But at the same time, I think people will look to the state and will look to a, a powerfully protective government. I think that's something we need to be careful about. Um, and there's always a tendency, I think, when people feel scared, when people feel endangered to, to want a, a bigger state and, and want a, a, a greater role for the government. Now, during COVID, I think there probably was a, a kind of ethical justification for that, a utilitarian justification for that. Um, normally, it would not be acceptable for a contact tracer to knock on your door and tell you, you can't leave your home for 14 days because you've come into contact with someone who's had COVID. Now, on the other hand, though, if you're in a danger to other people, you know, just applying a, a million harm principle here, um, we do have to restrict your liberty for that short period of time to maximize everyone else's liberty and freedom um, and their ability to prosper. So during a, an emergency, there is a justification for a larger state. Um, what you have to do, though, as someone who's, you know, on the classical liberal or libertarian side of this argument is say, well, we accept that these are extraordinary times that call for an extraordinary role of the state. You, as someone who is pro-state, have to also accept the fact that this is an extraordinary time and that what works during an extraordinary time should not work during a normal time. And therefore, it is totally incoherent to say, well, let's say because the government spent lots of money during a global pandemic where they've had to you know, secure people's jobs to freeze the economy in place, that that should be the norm and that the state should normally spend that much money or that the state should normally have that much debt. Absolutely not. So you've, you've got to be able to set, separate the extraordinary from the normal and accept that during an extraordinary case, there will be some additional level of state involvement and in the inverse um, there shouldn't be that level of involvement after the pandemic and I think we are in a bit of a challenge here um, when it comes to making the argument for smaller state this is not necessarily our era it's no longer the 80s and I wasn't even born in the 80s but the, these things kind of go in cycles to some extent um, and we seem to be at a cycle where people have an increased conf in confidence um, uh, at, or at least yearning for the role of the state and the role of government and I think to counteract that we have to push back with discussions about, well, where is the state competent and where isn't it competent? The state is, you know, it's it's kind of harder in Australia in a sense because Australia has been relatively untouched by the pandemic. But in the UK, for example, there's been so much extraordinary state failure. If your response to a pandemic in which over 130,000 people have died, be largely, not completely largely, but in, in no small part because of um, bad government policies. If, you're, if your response to that is, oh, I still think I want the government to do more, then perhaps you need to check your line of thinking before we as advocates of smaller governments say, no, what we need to do is rethink the role of the state. So it is difficult. Um, it is difficult once a precedent is set, 
once a policy is put in place um, to then get rid of that policy. Um, the classic case here is the welfare state. The welfare state um, does not shrink. It, it's slightly, you know, chiseled at the sides every day, now and then. But because there are beneficiaries of the welfare state, there are people who expect transfers from the government. It's very hard um, to get rid of it. The, the political backlash becomes too big once you have a program in place. And even if you go back to, you know, you can look at Abbott, you can look at Thatcher and Reagan, um, great proponents of a smaller state and, and in some ways succeeded, particularly in the UK with privatisations. Um, the, the size of the state did not shrink under Thatcher. The government did not spend less. There were more programs in the 90s. And then you had the, the, the irony, of course, is even if Thatcher was relatively a major, were relatively restrained with spending, the prosperity they then created um, was then taxed up by Blair, who then spent all the money anyway. So it's sort of this great irony that even if our side of politics might reduce the size of state, um, the other side will come in and just spend the money anyway. So what's the point in us putting in the effort to reduce the size of the state or, or at least by us, I mean the politicians um, on the centre right. I, I think we are in a difficult situation here. Um, I, I don't think I have a particularly positive, a positive, optimistic message. I think it is genuinely quite difficult, and, and we saw that during the early Abbott era and the first hockey budget to very narrowly reduce spending. And I think you have to make a, a very strong argument for it. One era, one government that was relatively successful, I, you can point to, is the um, the Cameron government in kind of two thousand to 10 to 2015, that the kind of coalition with the Liberal Democrats, um, they did actually manage to bring what was a very unsustainable spending in the UK under control by making an argument about fiscal responsibility. Um, and you can also point to the evidence here, which is if you want to reduce the size of your debt and deficit, um, increasing taxes doesn't work because that reduces the size of the economy and means that as a proportion of the economy, you end up with more tax and more debt. What you actually need to do is, is decrease spending. So yeah, I think you've got to make arguments like that, that if you want to get in a sustainable position, you have to deal with the spending issues and that spending has gone too far. Now, unfortunately, I don't think we're really seeing that um, particularly now in the, in the moment in the UK, and we're certainly not seeing it in Australia. But I, I think that's the, the kind of argument that we have to make. So this was an argument uh, made by Tyler Cowan, who is the, the brilliant um, George Mason University economist and uh, I think head of the Makeda Center there. Um, he, at, on January 1st, in, in very good timing, uh, wrote a blog post about the idea of state capacity libertarianism that, that effectively not too different to what I've been arguing during this uh, um, discussion, that we should see a lot of the failures around in society as, as failures of the state. So failures of the education system, failure to build necessary infrastructure, um, failure to, in this case, prepare for a pandemic um, and have appropriate systems in place in a lot of countries. So as a result of that, libertarians should, if we want to maximize human prosperity, we, we want a um, society that also protects liberty, but also delivers for people in terms of meaningful outcomes. Um, we should be interested in building up the state capacity in, in building up um, what the state needs to do to achieve that. Now, I slightly differ from Tyler Cowell in the sense that I think he would accept more state responsibilities than I would. For example, I don't think the state has um, any role whatsoever to really be involved in innovation entrepreneurship. I think that is should be exclusively a market role and where the state should be involved, it's in reducing red tape and reducing regulations and reducing taxes that create barriers to that innovation, that entrepreneurship. Um, while some other kind of fans of state capacity see a far greater role for the government in the innovation space and picking winners. So I, I, don't, I don't think you can necessarily do this universally. You still have to consider where the state should and shouldn't be involved. But, but I think if we've learned anything over last year, it's that the capacity of the state to function effectively has very real and meaningful impacts on our prosperity, on our liberty. I mean, we saw an extraordinarily long lockdown in, in Melbourne, in Victoria, because of a failure of state capacity. Um, and ultimately, if we're going to prosper, we want a state that is, is small, competent, capable, 
streamlined, focused, um, but also quite effective. So it's about ensuring that you achieve both of those goals simultaneously um, to deliver the most for, for people out there. Thank you for having me.